in the last UFC pay-per-view of 2018, they decided to go from Las Vegas to Inglewood, California, obviously because of the John Jones drug test issues and the questions about the picograms, whether or not he had taken a new ingestion, whether it was an old ingestion. Uh, regardless of that, I'm just going to kind of go through the entire card from top to bottom, uh, starting at the bottom, and I'll just kind of follow along the slideshow of pictures that we have from Esther Lim and MMA fighting. In the first fight of the night, Montel Jackson defeated Brian Keller by Darsh Choke. Uh, he had him rocked and then was able to finish on the ground by uh, securing the Darsh Choke. Obviously, Montel's got very long arms for the division, so you would figure the Darsh would be a good option for him, and it seems like it's definitely something that he's worked on a lot and gotten really good at. So good finish for him there. It'll be nice to see where he goes from here. Uh, those look good in his past fights, so it'll be nice to see him move up the rankings and fight some better opponents. In the fight after that, we had Montel Jackson. Again, this is the same fight. Uh, then we had Curtis Millinder against C.R. Bahadur Zada. Millinder won this fight, I believe it was 29-28 on most of the judges' scorecards. Uh, both fighters had their um, had their moments in there. C.R. did pretty good late with the takedowns, being able to control Curtis on top. Curtis was looking pretty tired at the end there. Wasn't the most technical in his escapes, but... Did enough to avoid too much damage and did enough early on to win enough rounds to get the fight. So then just to kind of go through some of the other images from there. So there's him landing on CR a couple different times. Again, another shot that he landed. Curtis is um, pretty long, pretty strong, and um, has a lot of creative techniques that he likes to throw on the feet. So even though his grappling could use some work, he's still a really exciting fighter to watch when he's standing up. And that's what made the matchup with CR pretty interesting. And that CR is also a very good striker on his, in his own right. But uh, Curtis was able to edge him out enough to get the victory here. Still going through some pictures. Uh, the fight after that was Bavon Lewis versus Uriah Hall. Um, if you didn't see the fight, you'd probably think Uriah did really well. He actually didn't do very well at all. Bavon Lewis did a fantastic job of really closing, cor cornering him off against the cage, making sure that the fights took place in boxing range and not in kicking range, which is where Uriah wanted it to be. Um, Bavon was in his face the entire time, did a really good job of landing some heavy shots. Uriah showed a pretty good chin and taking some pretty hard shots from Bavon. But ultimately, in the third round, he was able to land big on him and ended up catching him with a single punch that put him out. And what was interesting about that punch is it looked like he was kind of stepping backwards. Here's a picture of that punch, I believe, where Hall's weight is actually kind of leaning backwards as he throws it. But Uriah's punches are incredibly hard. So for him, that was enough to put Bavon out of there and get the victory. So for Bavon, it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. Obviously, he looked really good against a ranked opponent, was winning most of the fight, just got caught by one punch. Showed that he can hang with the top 15 guys. It'll be interesting to see if they put him up against another top 15 guy right away and say, hey, we kind of feel like what happened was a bit of a fluke. We want to see you in there against another elite guy. Or if they just give him another guy who's a little bit further down the chain, maybe in the like 25 to 30 range, and let him work his way back up before he, he fights someone like Uriah again. So again, more pictures of here. It makes it look like it was a bit closer, but Bavon had a clear edge. Here's an example of Bavon having Uriah up against the fence. Uh, the fight after that was Nathaniel Wood against Andre Ewell. Nathaniel Wood ended up winning this fight by rear naked choke. Um, was he able to get Ewell down on the ground, and once he got to the ground, it didn't look like Ewell really knew what he was doing there. It didn't really seem comfortable attacking. I I'm sure he doesn't know. I I'm sure he's not completely clueless on the ground, but I feel like he felt that Wood had a good advantage there, and if he started opening up, that Wood would start to use it against him. So he was very defensive, but Wood still found a way to get past his guard, ended up taking his back and choking him out. So here we have some pictures. Here, I think it's kind of a funny picture where Wood's got the choke in. Ewell doesn't really seem to be defending with either of his hands. I think at that point, he kind of realized the end was near and kind of let it happen. Same thing here again, chokes in, neither hand is defending. And at this point, he kind of just realizes it's over for him. Got his back taken. Here's him getting knocked down. Has his back taken again. Again, similar picture to before. Nice shot that Wood was landing. Uh, good elbow from the guard by Nathaniel Wood. Good punches from the guard. Again, really strong performance from Wood. Uh, the next fight was Ryan Hall over BJ Penn. Uh, this was a really interesting fight to me in that I felt like if this, if this has happened five years ago, or if you take the current Ryan Hall and put him up against an older BJ Penn, that this would be a wipeout for BJ Penn. The BJ would be heavily favored. It figures boxing would be really effective against Ryan Hall. I'd be able to pressure him well, um, be able to manage distance, not get caught in any um, tough grappling scrambles. 
he actually looked pretty good coming out. I was surprised at how aggressive he was at the start, but Ryan Hall was able to create some space, ended up getting that MNR roll, and then off the MNR roll was able to finish the heel hook that BJ had actually, in trying to defend, he actually spun into it and made it worse for himself. So here's just Ryan's reaction after the fight. This looks like it was right after the tap. Uh, this appears to be when the heel hook was in. Uh, this was from earlier in the fight. Um, there, there was a little time frame where Ryan Hall was trying to grab a hold of BJ's legs. BJ was doing a good job of defending and then ended up creating some space and started kicking back at, at Ryan. So it was kind of like this battle of up kicks versus, I wouldn't necessarily call them soccer kicks because they weren't to the head, but effectively they were like soccer kicks to the legs. And the fight before the or the fight after that would have been Petter Jan versus Douglas Silva de Andrade. Jan is a guy who I think a lot of people feel belongs in the top 15 already, but just hasn't had the chance to prove that he belongs by beating the, some of the top guys. Uh, and Silva de Andrade, he fought a really dangerous guy, but not a guy who's ranked yet. So I don't know if this is going to put him in the rankings quite yet. But either way, it was still a good opportunity to fight against a really good Muay Thai fighter and prove that he's one of the best guys in the world. And he did just that. He was able to defeat him by a corner stoppage and I believe at the end of the second round. So here's some photos of him having him down on the ground and smashing him a little bit more. Some good punches landed on the feet. Again. And Petter has got really good boxing, so really, really wasn't a huge surprise that he was able to outland him on the feet and really do a good job of putting the pressure on him. Uh, the fight after that was Megan Anderson against Kat Zingano. A bit of a weird fight where Anderson threw a head kick and her toe landed in Zingano's eye. So if effectively it worked like an eye poke, but it wasn't like she used her finger, she used a toe. They called it a TKO. It sounds like Zingano plans on um, taking this up with the with the commission. Apparently the, she found somewhere in the rules where it says that you can't poke either with the digits on your hand, which would be the fingers, or the digits on your foot, which would be a toe. And if that's the case, this clearly was a, a toe digit in the eye. So it may get um, moved to a no contest. Obviously it wasn't intentional. And even if it was intentional, could you imagine being that accurate? I Obviously, you wouldn't think that that was what Anderson was going for, but it's what landed, and she got the victory early. And we'll see. Time will tell if that victory holds up or not. So here's that kick landing. So you can kind of see the toe on her right foot, or the big toe on her right foot ends up in Zingano's eye. Sort of hard to tell from this angle. This is from early in the fight. Um, and then we had Walt Harris against Andre Arlovsky in the main event of the FS1 prelims, the final fight that is going on on FS1, at least for now. Who knows whether or not they'll stick with the ESPN after the five-year deal or if they'll go back to Fox. That remains to be seen, but at least for the time being, this is the last fight that we saw in FS1. It wasn't a very good fight. Going in, obviously, Andre Arlovsky was compromised. You could tell by his nose. He probably broke it in training. Uh, still hung pretty tough. Um, neither of them were terribly active during the whole fight. It's not like they were really getting after each other. Seemed to be a bit of discomfort on both sides. I think Walt Harris was a little bit worried about what Arlovsky could do to him, and Arlovsky, I'm sure, was protecting his nose and trying to limit the damage that he took from the fight after what he took in training. But a, a rather boring fight, but Walt Harris was able to get the victory by unanimous decision. So here are just some photos from the fight. That looks to be a pretty nasty eye poke right there. And then we moved on to the main card with Alex Volkanovsky versus Chad Mendez. Volkanovsky ended up winning this fight by second round TKO. Now, I have a video that I put together after this that just goes over a little breakdown of what Chad Mendez did wrong leading up to this. On the feet, Volkanovsky had the edge. On the mat, uh, early on, Chad wasn't able to keep him down, but in, late in the second round, he actually did get him down and got his back. But he didn't do a very good job of controlling the shoulders, either with a seatbelt grip or any other type of grip. And in, in doing so, he ended up feeling a little bit uncomfortable, tried to switch from the back to the mount. And in that process, Volkanovski got out, got back to his feet, and then was able to finish off a tired Chad Mendez. So big victory for Volkanovski. Obviously, the guys who beat Mendez are all former champions at this point, with them being Aldo, um, Frankie Edgar, and Conor McGregor. So to add his name to that list is pretty big. It'll be interesting to see who he fights next. Um, it'll be interesting to see if Max Holloway's going to stick around at the top or not. Or if he's going to move up to 155, I guess would be the question there. There's a few more photos from that fight. Uh, the fight for that was Corey Anderson against Alir Latifi. Corey Anderson won this fight, uh, lost the first round, but then was able to 
uses conditioning and is reached later on in the second and third rounds. Latif had a real big opportunity in this fight to cement himself as a top five light heavyweight. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't able to keep up the pace that he had going on in the first round. For Anderson, this is another big win for him after the win over Glover Teixeira. It'll be interesting to see if he gets another shot at some of the guys in the top of the division who had beaten him previously and see if maybe he can come out on top this time and see if he's improved over time. Uh, so we got some more pictures from here. Just throughout the fight. Obviously, Latifi did good early. Anderson did a lot better late in the fight. Good shot there by Latifi. Good shot by Anderson. Good shot by Latifi. I believe that's probably during the first round. Uh, the fight after that, Michael Chiesa got the victory over Carlos Condit in the first round. Chiesa took Condit down. Did an okay job from top, but Condit was very aggressive. Kept attacking with submissions. Actually got really close with an armbar attempt. Um, I believe at the end of the round, he also was going for, uh, he was, he had a leg entanglement at one point. He's going for a heel. Like, I think he might've been looking for a straight ankle lock as well. Just kind of depending on what time during that, um, during that fight, what he was looking for, uh, as far as who won that first round, I think that was one of those rounds where depending on what sort of martial arts background you have, you might have a different opinion on who won. I'm obviously a little bit more, um, more biased towards jujitsu. So in, in that kind of did better on the feet. And then once it got to the mat, Kind of was the one attacking, even though he was on bottom. I, I would have to give the edge to Kind of that round. Either way, it never really got to the point where that mattered because in the second round, Kiesa again took him down. Uh, went for a Kimura from the top of half guard up against the fence, was able to isolate the arm. Um, got pretty far with both arms, but then um, switched off to a single arm to get the finish. Did a good job of then staying heavy on his shoulder to kind of collapse his shoulder down in the mat um, as his arm was extended out. Looked pretty nasty at the end if you um, look, look at the photo at the end there. And Kiesa was able to get the tap. Here's the picture right here. So obviously you, you can tell by his shoulder pressure, if it lets me highlight there, that that shoulder is pressing down here, which is going to then push the shoulder down. And that's going to put even more pressure here and possibly snap it if, ta if Conant doesn't tap in time. So good job by Conant to recognize that and tap before he took any serious damage. I don't think he ended up getting um, any kind of long-term injury from this, but he was pretty close to with how far that submission ended up going. Um, and let me see if it lets me go from here. So this is just from earlier in the fight. So a bit of a scramble they had. Uh, here was Conant's armbar attempt. Uh, again, pretty close from him. Uh, here's him attacking the legs again. So sort of like a bit of a 50-50 position where he's got his leg pointed out to the outside hip. And he's um, trying to triangle around there. Again, there's potential for um, for a heel hook. Kiesa did a good job of defending and staying out of it. And then from the feet where Kanda was doing a good job of landing. Um, and what was a, a bit of a shock to me, obviously the the odds were fairly close in this fight. I think uh, Nunes was about a 2-1 to one underdog, which for a cyborg fight is pretty close. And the line actually moved a lot on fight night, so it seemed like a lot of people felt like Nunes had a real shot here. Uh, this To me, this fight went under the radar largely because of what happened with John Jones, but this is one of those things where you have a fighter who's been dominant for so long, and then to see them go out and go out in such a spectacular fashion, it's a bit shocking. It reminds me a bit of when Anderson Silva got knocked out by Chris Weidman. Um, it reminds me of when Ronda Rousey got knocked out by Holly Holm. Um, sadly, this one isn't going to get that much attention, which is a bit of a shame. And I'll, I'll kind of go into it later in a separate um, in, in a separate tangent about why I don't think Amanda Nunes is the star that people think she should be, but... Regardless, for her to get this win in 51 seconds, uh, took a stiff shot from Cyborg early, but then was able to land her shots frequently after rocking Cyborg. Cyborg was just kind of kept coming forward, didn't really look to take her down or really slow down the fight, just kind of looked to keep attacking, even though she was rocked, and that ended up being her undoing. So here we just kind of have some photos from after the fight. Amanda Nunes celebrating after the fight, after becoming a, a champ champ, as Conor McGregor likes to say. So here's her landing. Again, a big right hand. A lot of big looping punches, but they are very accurate. So again, just more of Amanda Nunes pressing Cyborg up against the fence and landing big. You can kind of tell by Cyborg's face right there. It doesn't look so great. Here was Cyborg landing early on Amanda. But again, Amanda was able to take it and land her own shots and obviously did a lot more damage than Cyborg was able to do to her. Again, Amanda landing... You can see a lot of intensity in Amanda's face during this fight. She definitely wasn't afraid of Cyborg in, in any way. 
And in the main event, it was John Jones against Alexander Gustafson. Um, going into this fight, Jones talked a lot about how he really didn't put too much um, preparation in ahead of their original fight, and that's why Gustafson made it so close. And that the second time around, he was going to take it a lot more seriously, and the results would be a lot different. And if that's um, if that's actually the case, if he actually didn't train very hard in the first fight, it, it definitely seems plausible now based on how this performance went. Completely dominant from start to finish. It's not like Gustafson really ever seemed to be that close. Uh, right off the bat, Jones did a good job of keeping him at bay with the kicks. Uh, did a good good job of managing range, and then from there he was able to just pick him apart on the feet. Eventually, got him to the ground in the third round, and once he got him down, there wasn't much that Gus could do. John did a good job of controlling from top of half guard. Uh, eventually, he was able to pass. Uh, almost got his crucifix where he could land elbows from there. I believe Vladimir Matyushenko he defeated by that. Um, good job by Gustafson to get out of that, but wasn't for long. Eventually, he got caught um, with his back taken. Jones did a good job of hipping into him and landing ground and pound from the top, landed some really heavy shots. Gus really couldn't get anywhere, couldn't go anywhere. Fight got stopped, good stoppage, and it now puts John Jones back on top of the light heavyweight mountain. Uh, he's talking about after the fight how he wants Daniel Cormier to come back down to him. He doesn't want to go up to heavyweight. It's always been something weird for me in that John Jones is a guy who could have easily been champ champ a long time ago, I feel. But he hasn't seemed to have the ambition to move up to heavyweight and actually win fights up there. So... Again, it doesn't look like Cormier, even though he's a guy who he's beaten twice and would be a perfect matchup for him to move up to heavyweight against. It doesn't seem like that's something that Jones is interested in, at least for now. So again, just to go through some final photos of the fight, but that was the main event. And moving forward, it'll be interesting to see who Jones fights next. It seems like either Cormier or Anthony Smith will be the next fights. Either way, I think it should be a fairly... Um, I guess Cormier could be difficult for him. Cormier actually was fairly competitive before the head kick. But Anthony Smith, to me, seems like a really, really easy fight for John Jones. I don't think Smith is going to be able to give him a whole lot of problem, on the feet, a whole lot of trouble on the feet. And then once the fight hits the mat, Smith is actually a black belt. He just got his black belt, but he's not exactly the most submission savvy black belt out there. He, he's fa- fairly good positionally, but Jones is, seems to excel against a lot of guys who are also very good positional black belts. So I don't see why Anthony Smith would give him any trouble there where others haven't. So then here is the end where John Jones had Gustafson's back and was raining down strikes on him to get the stoppage. Just some work from the top, a half guard here. With him controlling him, keeping him on the mat. Good job with the jab to keep him at range. Defending against an elbow, throwing his own elbow. This little body punch of the body here. Changing levels, good front kick, keep him out of bay. Look hard row before the match, and that is the final photo. So that would end my recap of UFC 232.